Thank you so much for jumping in today. We are so, so, so excited about this webinar. It is going to be an amazing time. We are here with Malak, again, our personal favorite, and we're talking about leaning into body acceptance. So before we get started, I wanted to do a little breakdown. Clarity Fitness is my gym. It is out of Decatur, Georgia, and it is an amazing space that is all about body positive wellness. And we're here bringing topics and webinars and communications and presentations like this to the forefront of everyone's mind so that we can really help change the world of wellness into a more positive and empowering and uplifting space. So with webinars like these, we're really talking about how we can start to have more compassion for ourselves and how we can learn to be on the same team as instead of working against our bodies. I also, while we're on here, wanted to talk a little bit about our really amazing membership deal that we have going. Obviously, things are funky right now with COVID, but whether you are in the Decatur area or anywhere around the country, we are offering a Seeing Double deal, which is two free months of membership. So if you are interested in joining our in-person or virtual memberships today, you would have three months of membership for only $40. We're prorating to the sixth of the month and then for the first month, and then the next two months are completely $0 to you as a thank you from us for joining in August. The virtual membership includes a moment of clarity email, which is super fun. It has a little workout idea. It has some positivity, some fun little pictures like penguins walking downstairs and cute stuff. And then it has some just uplifting things to keep your email box a little more positive in this funky time. If you are in person, we also are back open halfway in our facility. So we are offering that gym space and everyone has access to our members only Facebook group off of this deal that gets you unlimited group exercise classes, as well as some really cool perks and discounts and deals there. Without further ado, I want to introduce our amazing speaker, Malak Sadie. She is amazing at what she does and absolutely brilliant in all things body acceptance, food, fueling your body. And I wanted to kick off by giving her bio and then I will pass the mic to you. So throughout her career, Malak has given over 100 presentations in over 20 different states. Malak radiates behind the podium, not only as a keynote speaker, but also in cooking and nutrition workshops that are amazing that we've had on Clarity, and she's the best. <laughs> Malak flourishes when speaking and enjoys sharing her passion and educating with zeal. Thank you so, so much for being here, and we are so, so excited to welcome Malak Sadie. Thank you so much, Abby, for that introduction. I am so excited to be here with everybody. Um, I am really grateful for this opportunity and I am hoping that you guys will take a couple of tools um, and tips from this presentation. Today we are going to be talking about body acceptance and body neutrality. Um, you're going to hear me utilize those words interchangeably, body neutrality, body acceptance, or body positivity. I feel like that there is a spectrum of, uh, of of, of those words and you might notice me uh, saying those uh, throughout the presentation. So uh, let's get started. All right. So uh, as Abby said, my name is Malak Sadie. Uh, I always, you know, whenever I present or go and see a speaker, I'm always so interested and intrigued in who is behind the podium. And so I just wanna, uh, have you guys get to know me a little bit better. I am a first generation Lebanese Canadian American Muslim. I was uh, raised uh, in Michigan um, and moved here to Texas about four years ago for um, a job opportunity. And I am a dietitian. I've been a dietitian for over 11 years. I love what I do. I'm so grateful uh, for the opportunities that I've had and I really could not have picked a better, better job. Um, I'm so grateful for the clients that allow me to walk alongside them 
and uh, allowed me to guide them through through this journey. So as a registered dietitian, that's where my RD comes from. I'm also a certified eating disorder registered dietitian supervisor and a body positive facilitator and a certified intuitive eating counselor. Uh, I am a middle child. I have an older sister and a younger brother and I definitely get the middle child syndrome sometimes. I will be the first to admit. And I am a khalta, which means aunt in Arabic, to the cutest niece ever. She is turning one soon, and she just learned how to blow kisses, and it is the sweetest thing ever. So uh, that is who I am. I'm excited for you guys to be um, be here, and I hope you guys learn learn a little bit more. So without further ado, let's let's get into it. So today, what we're going to be talking about is. Um, four different, uh, four different tips uh, to to learn to lean into body acceptance, uh, and then some tools and prompts and things like that to help us along the way. But before I get started with that, I want us to look at the spectrum of health. And so sometimes it's hard to know where, like, where does the distortion start to come in? Where is it healthy? What is appropriate? What is not? What is normal? What has diet culture taught us? what is the belief in my own self. And this chart is a wonderful chart made by my colleague, Allison Mark, um, and I absolutely love it. And I wanted to share it with you guys. And so basically when we look at health, we look at body acceptance, we look at maybe body neutrality, or uh, intuitively eating to, we're fueling our body for both, uh, not only to fuel ourselves, but also for pleasure. We're moving our bodies in an enjoyful way. It doesn't feel like it's required or that in order for me to have X, Y, Z food, I have to uh, exercise and work out and do these things to compensate. Weight is kind of is stable. We're not yo-yoing. We're not going kind of up and down with our diets and, and the weight. Where it starts to become disordered is maybe we start to focus a little bit more on, on our bodies there's a lot of shame or there starts to be some shame and some guilt around it. Maybe we start to dabble in dieting, maybe using some food to cope with emotions, um, using, I should say, primarily using food to cope with emotions um, and not using substances like maybe laxatives or diet pills. So we're starting to kind of see, starting to kind of mess around and see what we think might work in order for us to achieve this ideal and the standard that society has, has provided us with. And there's a lot of weight cycling. So we're losing weight, gaining weight, losing weight, and gaining weight, which just a reference is extremely unhealthy. Um, and it's much better to stay at a stable weight than to engage in that yo-yoing. And so, uh, we start to kind of like dabble with dieting and where it becomes an eating disorder is what I want to look at is like how often are the behaviors happening. I've listed, we've listed out um, different types of eating disorders. I'm not going to go into the specific definitions of each. If you're interested, please feel free to email me and I can um, elaborate a little bit more. But when we engage in the eating disorder behaviors, there is uh, a sense of um, obsession around food, around body image, not feeling good enough or satisfied. There's a lot of shame and guilt. We're noticing that we're engaging in behaviors way, may, way more often throughout the week. Um, and typically what we look at it is like, how often are these behaviors happening in a three month period? Have they increased, decreased? Have they shifted? What has kind of gone on with that? So, um, so that's how we can kind of decide where we, where we, lie in the spectrum of health. Um, and I think this is really helpful for us to assess, like, where are we right now? And so how do we get back to that um, body authenticity and body neutrality place? So let's start off with our first one. Let's reclaim our health. So reclaiming our health means that we are going to be taking ownership of our of our bodies and our health we become the expert we are the experts of our body um, and before i even continue further looking even like back into history so i'm not sure if any of you guys know um, the history of the bmi but the bmi was created many many years ago by an astronomer slash mathematician 
Um, he created it just looking at height and weight, not looking at um, uh, gender, ethnicity, race. He tested out his BMI uh, equation on European white men and then provided it for the world to continue using hundreds of years later and misguiding people into believing that uh, weight is a qualifier for a uh, determinant of, of health and it's absolutely not. And so I encourage you, you know, I, I have a lot of clients that I so unfortunately often hear that, um, you know, when they were younger, they went to the doctor's office and the doctor showed them their BMI charts and really um, emphasized that they were not starting to be normal anymore or highlighting their weight fluctuations, which in children, it's absolutely normal, right? Like they're going through puberty, um, they're growing. Uh, and so there, it is, it is very misleading. So I do encourage you that if you have your own children or if you have some nieces or nephews uh, and, you, and they're going to the doctor, I would strongly recommend that uh, to ask the doctor not to share that information with them and that if they would like to share that information that they can do it with you independently but with the child not inside the, not in the room. Uh, there's also a really great organization called bodylovesociety.org I believe who have little cards like business cards that say please don't weigh my uh, my child and uh, I've used them before. There's, one, there's some for adults as well. And when I go to check in, I've given the, you know, the person who's checking me in the card and asking them not to weigh me. It's hit or miss sometimes, honestly, if they listen or, or not. But uh, you know, that's what brings us to that third point is that I am the expert of my body. And if, you know, if I'm coming in for, you know, for a specific reason, my weight does not need to always uh, be there or be, you know, be identified. Uh, because I feel so often, unfortunately, once it's marked and it gets carried into the BMI, so often the doctors might just look at that and not look at us as a person. So I really encourage you to advocate for yourself. And uh, uh, if you, if the, if weight is not necessary for your visit, then please make sure to tell them that you don't need it. Um, and if they would, you'd like to know why they want it. I'm sorry, my pup is noticing some, some, some noises out there. <laughs> uh, but the, the next part that I would like us to, to identify in reclaiming our health is finding health at every size professionals and providers. So you're gonna hear the term PAYS uh, used often. And it is uh, abbreviated for health at every size. The definition of health at every size means that health at every size maintains that people can follow a healthy lifestyle and have good metabolic fitness and good overall life quality and reduce the risk of disease no matter what their size. So basically, we cannot judge somebody's health based upon what they look like. That there is so much more to a person than just the way that they appear. And it's so important that we notice that, uh, or that we, we understand that. So just because you're going to a doctor doesn't mean the doctor knows everything. If you don't feel like something is right, you know, speak up. You are absolutely allowed to, to say something. You know, we are constantly suffering, trying to shrink ourselves, trying to take up less space, and focusing on, you know, moving our bodies and changing the way that we are for, for other people, you know. Um, you know, sometimes I think like if I'm going to a grocery store or somewhere and, um, you know, it's like I'm constantly wanting to maneuver, maneuvering my body instead of, uh, you know, having other people also maneuver their, their own bodies. So you are absolutely allowed to take up space. You are worthy of that. Um, and you, there's no, no need to, to, to sit through this suffering. My hope is, again, through this presentation is that I can give you guys some really great tools to, to begin to do that. So as we reclaim our health, well, what does that look like? How can I, what can I do to, to do that a little bit more? So let's take a look here. 
at the tools to use. So this presentation honestly is a mixture of, of a couple of books in my body positive facilitator education and um, and I'll resource them um, at the end and definitely highlight because uh, most most of these prompts honestly are not directly from me. Um, and so I definitely want to give credit where credit is due. But uh, journal prompts. So these are really helpful for us to start to take a look into, into our health and into our body. Ask yourselves, have you experienced size privilege? You know, can you go to a store and buy whatever you want? Uh, can you sit in an airplane chair very comfortably? Can you access stairs or um, resources easily? If you're at a restaurant, do your thighs touch the, you know, the hand or the, what is it? The chair, the handles, armchairs, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, but noticing these things and, I do kind of actually want to reference back even to that last slide. You know, if you we, if we are calling ourselves health at every size professionals or providers, it is extremely important that we also acknowledge if that if we're in an office or we have an office where our clients come in, to make sure that our space is accessible. You can say that you're a health at every size, you know, provider, but if you have a BMI chart and tiny little chairs, that's not a health and every size provider. You're providing only for um, smaller size bodies. And so that is not, that is not health at every size. So how have you experienced size privilege? Whether you're in a larger body, whether you're in a smaller body, whether you're small, fat, large, it doesn't matter. How have you experienced it? What has it felt like? The second one, I love this you know, how and what ways have you asked to apologize for your body, apologizing for your body for taking up space, or, um, or uh, for example, actually, I just recently went to the doctor's office, I had to get my blood drawn, and uh, she was telling me that my veins rolled, and I was like apologizing for my veins rolling, and I, and I paused for a moment, and I was like, wow, like, it's not like I have control over my veins. It's not like I'm, I did something intentionally, but I was apologizing to the nurse for it, you know? And so it took me a minute. I pulled back a little bit and was like, hey, slow down. But there's so many ways I feel like we're constantly, you know, saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for taking up space. I'm sorry if I touched you or, you know, of course there's a level of respect, but there's also a place where that if my body is taking up space, that is okay, you are allowed to do that and you are worthy of that. And then ask yourself, have you compared yourself? Have you compared to someone else? Have you compared maybe even to your thinner self or larger self or your future self? How does it make you feel? Is it helpful? Is it harmful? Did it impact your view of others? Um, you know, the BMI is extremely, not only is it inaccurate, but it's fat phobic and it's racist and it is um, absolutely not helpful. So when we look at that, like if we're looking at ourselves and if we're in a thinner, smaller body, how are we judging other people who are in, in fat bodies? Do you go and sit next to somebody who's in a fat body and they're at that airplane? Uh, do you acknowledge your privilege? And so I think that those prompts can really help us start to think about the way that um, how we take up space in society and how and, and allowing us to do so. Another really cool thing, and I love this assignment, um, you know, every time I've done it, everybody does it in so many different ways and it's really cool. But, you know, create your own health vision board. You know, diet culture unfortunately has robbed us of the terminology of health and healthy. Um, and I want to reclaim that, that I am allowed to take ownership of my health and my health does not just include maybe my blood work or my weight, but includes mental health, spiritual health, physical health, financial health, career health. And so with this, I kind of envision it in the sense that I would put health in the center and then kind of have those different things that I connect with that I would like to improve my health. And maybe come up with a couple of, you know, smart, realistic goals. So, for example, one of my physical um, health goals for, for this year has been to, to drink more water. 
So I like to drink three. Um, my goal is to drink at least three of, you know, three of these. So starting off with something that feels doable and feels realistic to do. Um, it's really cool. Some people just write it out. Some people collage, some people draw, some people paint. And I, I really love this. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that your health is, is always changing. And so it's okay to reevaluate it in six months. You know, honestly, when I did mine, I did mine in January before quarantine. And once March hit, I was like, I need to change some things up because this is not realistic anymore, you know? And so it is okay to do that. Um, what I like to do is put like a couple, one to three goals with each of them or things I'd like to work on. And then also on the other side, put the things that I've accomplished to help remind me, yes, I have achieved things and I am working on it. And you know what? Yeah, it's not perfect, but there is progress. You know, it's, it's absolutely about progress and not perfection. And then the last one is begin to explore your body story. Learn more about your roots, your foundation. What, what messages did you receive around your body image? You know, think back even to when you were a child, when you went to the pediatrician's office and you saw, you know, the charts or the little kids. What did the little kids look like? Maybe they were all thin in a certain size body. And then maybe even the cartoons or the TV shows that you started to watch or mom was dieting or your friends were dieting. And so all these messages, you know, become rooted in us and, and they give us a foundation, unfortunately. But unfortunately, unfortunately, fort fortunately in the sense that I, my hope is that we're more aware through doing this and being like, oh, no wonder I, no wonder I feel like this. I feel like this because I've been taught that. This has been in my foundation. And so the more that we are aware, I, my hope is that it takes away that blame and that pressure away from ourselves. So learn more about our roots. Think about where it started. And then also think about where we are today in this moment in our bodies. How do we feel about it? And then think about how you want it to flourish. I kind of think of it like a flower or a tree, you know, with your roots, the trunk, and then the, the petals. But it's really important to, to be able to, again, to see the big picture. Because my hope is, is it's, this is not your fault. You know, unfortunately, diet culture has, has confused us. Um, and it's been really challenging at times. So, so yeah, first step, reclaim your health. Take ownership of it. Know that, you know, not, not everybody is the expert, even if they're a doctor, you are the expert and you are absolutely allowed to question things. So, so let's talk a little bit about practicing intuitive self-care. Um, I just did a presentation um, for Clarity, I think, what, a couple of weeks ago uh, on intuitive eating. So if you would love to learn more about the 10 principles, I go much more in depth with them. Um, I highly recommend you guys check it out. Um, it's on their YouTube channel. Um, so please go ahead and, and listen to it and see how the different principles uh, can be applied in our lives. One thing that I absolutely love about intuitive eating is there's a phrase that she, they commonly use and it's called, uh, it's for the most part. For the most part, I'm an intuitive eater. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I may have a stressful work week and I am, I might use food to cope with my, my emotions and that's okay. For the most part, I'm an intuitive eater and sometimes I'm not. I like to sometimes use the example of um, I'm Lebanese and I'm actually going home uh, back to Michigan to visit my family soon. And I cannot wait. I cannot wait to get all the delicious, yummy food. Um, and I probably will not be an intuitive eater. Um, you know, my grandma is making fresh bread and hummus and rice and all these different amazing dishes that I grew up on. And to allow myself and give myself that permission that it's okay if it's not perfect um, at that time. So that's the, that's the intuitive eating principles. And the definition with intuitive eating is that it's an approach that teaches us how to create a healthy relationship with, our, with food, with our mind and our body, where ultimately we become the experts of our own body. The beauty of intuitive eating and these principles is we can kind of jump back and forth through them. 
Honestly, when quarantine started, my hunger and fullness cues were all over the place. So it was helpful for me to reset. It was helpful for me to identify using my hunger and fullness scale um, and, 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 and getting back in tune with my body. Because it was, it was really stressful, you know, in the beginning. And even though I've been practicing this for years, I'm not, like, I'm not, I don't have a shield against, you know, uh, these, you know, mistakes or challenges that might come up. So use that internal wisdom to help guide us around food and movement and in and, and our lives. Also creating boundaries. I think this one is extremely important, whether it's us needing rest or us creating boundaries if somebody's constantly wanting us to go out to like um, eat with them all the time or uh, my grandma, let's use her again. You know, when I go back, uh, as soon as my plate is empty, it's like, Kuli, eat more, eat more, eat more. And it's out of love, right? And at the same time, it's like, but my body is telling me that I'm, I'm full. And so I, I'm done. Here's a little tip if you ever uh, visit a Lebanese family for, for dinner, always just leave a little bit of food left on your plate. So then, you know, it looks like you're still working on it. So they're not constantly adding it but create those boundaries. Um, and if that's how you're feeling in your body, honor those, honor those feelings. And resting when needed. It is so important um, to rest. We neglect it. We're in a society that's constantly do more, do more, do more and productivity. And uh, we're not taking the time to allow our bodies to heal. We're not taking care of ourselves. And it um, can really... Like when we're not taking care of our bodies, it can reflect maybe in our food choices, the way we feel about ourselves and our movement. And so there's a multitude of things that it can play into. So let's look at some tools that we can use to talk about this. All right. So, and just as a heads up, I'll uh, give this presentation to Abby. So. If you miss anything or want to reread something, email her um, and she will absolutely send it to you. But, uh, but yeah, so let's talk about these tools. I'm actually going to start at the bottom with heartbeat meditation. I should probably put it up top, but we'll start from there. So what the heartbeat meditation is, and if you, if you do meditate, that's absolutely fine. You can, you can do that as well. But this one doesn't require like any like any apps or anything like that. It's just you and yourself. And so what I do is I sit down and I have my feet flat on the floor. I'm closing my eyes and I'm putting my hands on their knees, on my knees. And typically, right, we can feel our pulse through our neck or through our wrist or touching our heart. But what I'd like you to do in getting or connecting to our bodies is uh, closing our eyes and trying to count our heartbeats without using any of those common um, places that we may be able to identify our heartbeat. See if you can count and really get in touch with what is going on. You know, it's interesting because uh, hunger and fullness are natural cues that our body gives us. It's the same way as if we have to go to the bathroom, you know, our body, our body communicates to our brain, hey, I have to go to the bathroom and we go to the bathroom. What's so interesting is society has told us, if you're hungry, don't eat, or if you're full, eat half, you know, has, has skewed that. So your hunger and your fullness are natural things that your body knows how to do already. But unfortunately, diet culture comes in and that static and causes, causes a lot of confusion, giving us these numbers that we're supposed to follow. And so, you know, that you know, really it is, it's, it's getting back in touch. How do I feel? What does it feel like when I have to go to the bathroom? Where do I feel it in my body? When I'm thirsty, where is it at? Is it in my mouth? Do I, maybe I get a headache? So that way we're identifying it and it's like, oh yeah, you know what? If, if I'm getting a headache over here and then my throat is, that might mean actually that I'm thirsty and not um, you know, something else. So these are body cues. Uh, so it's helpful to, to get back in touch with them. Another great thing to do is write a letter to your body. You can apologize for what you've put it through if you've been dieting or using laxatives or engaging in eating disorder behaviors, and then also thanking it for what it's done for you. 
So it's really helpful, I think, to connect with it. And also this is a place where you can continue to grow with it and say like, all right, what, what do I want to continue to do for my body? The mindful meal, sorry, I know I'm jumping all over, but I'm trying to connect some of, some of these. So a mindful meal would be, I try once a week. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not always the best at it. Uh, sometimes it is really nice to sit and just uh, have dinner in front of the TV. Um, but at, once a week, I try to sit at my kitchen table. I will prepare myself a really nice meal. I'll use the nice silverware. I'll make myself uh, bring out some sparkling water, maybe things that I would do for other people, but not so often for myself because I am worthy of that. We all are worthy of that. Um, and so really try to do that. And then even think about, think, look at the food. Is it, what color is it? What's the taste, the texture, the temperature? After you've eaten your meal, write a letter to it. You can jot down some thoughts, journal, make a poem about it, whatever feels, feels right. But it's also just the same way that we're thanking our body for what it does. It's also okay to thank our food for what it does. You know, when I think about it, the reason why I love being a dietitian is food is the one thing that brings, like it is common wherever you go. It is something that always brings us together um, in times of celebration, joy, sorrow, in religion, in culture, in traditions, in families, and even in, just as fuel. That it is absolutely okay to uh, have meals that may not necessarily be the most amazing thing, but I'm eating, I'm having this meal because I know at least I, I need to be nourishing myself right now. So writing a letter can be really helpful and attaching it to the mindful meal is also really good for doing them separately. It's absolutely okay too. And then the last one is a body descriptor. So the way I would do this is basically I'm describing my body in a non-judgmental way. Think of it as like, as if it would be like a sketch artist. So if I were to do this right now, I would do it in the mirror, um, maybe as I'm getting ready, and you can do your entire body, you can do parts of your body. It really just depends what feels right. It might feel easier to start off with something neutral like your hand before going to our stomach or vice versa. So the way that I would do it is I would say, so my, I have brown curly hair, it's pulled back. I have a yellow headband on. I have brown uh, thick eyebrows and I have blue eyes. I have a large nose and when I talk, you can see my laugh lines. I have pink lips and as I'm speaking, you can also see my teeth. I have a round face. I'm wearing earrings and a necklace. And so we're beginning to describe our bodies in neutral ways. Sorry for the close up, but uh, <laughs> I was just using it to, to, you know, to show how, it, how it's done. So do with your feet again, any part. With the body descriptor, it's really helpful to continually do it. It's not something that I would just say like, okay, you can do it once and you're done. Um, but it really kind of, it does, it helps bring, helps create body acceptance. But this is just my body and I'm just describing it in a neutral way. It's not bad, it's not good, it's not ugly, it's, it's just, it's a body. That's what it is. It's a vehicle to transport me through my day-to-day -day life. So, so let's look at the, the next one. All right, so how do we cultivate, cultivating self-love, self-love, self-care, whatever it might be, um, what, whichever words feels more comfortable. But I mean, who better to start off this, this point with a, a Brene Brown quote, practicing self-love means leaning or learning how to trust ourselves, to treat ourselves with respect and to be kind and affectionate towards ourselves. And when was the last time you took yourself on a date? And when was the last time that you told yourself that you loved yourself? Um, and everybody is going to develop their own self-love self practice. How do I begin to feel comfortable in this body and find my own confidence from within? You know, it's, if we're constantly seeking it from society, it's like we're chasing that carrot and it's never going to be good enough. It's never going to be satisfying. 
And in this moment right now, you are worthy of any of those dreams that you may have, that car that you want, or that house that you want, and that vacation. You are worthy to do that right now. You don't have to wait until we're a certain size or a certain place in our lives. You know, if our, you know, if our friends are getting married or there's celebrations, you're allowed to wear whatever dress that you want that feels good um, for yourself. So feeling comfortable within our own skin. Like, okay, Malak, I understand that, but how am I gonna do that? Let me help you guys out. So here are some tools that we can use. Um, the first one is I am proud of. I really love this one because sometimes it might feel hard to feel that sense of confidence, but it's easier to think of it in the sense of, you know, I'm proud of my eyes for allowing me to see the world. I am proud of my hands that allow me to hug my dog. I am proud of my heart that keeps me alive. So sometimes it's easier to start with those internal organs. So then we start to then become, it becomes more external. I love mirror affirmations. If you ever came to my house, please don't, that's kind of weird, but if you ever did, <laughs> uh, you would see they're all over. I have little post-it notes um, everywhere of affirmations. Um, some of them I came up with them myself. Some of them I found on Pinterest. Some of them were from those little Dove chocolate um, wrappers. And I have, you know, they're, they're on my mirror in the bathroom. And if I'm having a tough week or something kind of speaks to me, I'll move one of them to the center to kind of focus on it um, and, and see it. Honestly, sometimes I don't need it, but just having them there allows me to see my body just as it is that I am strong, I am capable, and I am worthy of my dreams and being successful and um, buying that car. I don't know why I keep saying buying that car, but that's the first thing that keeps coming up to my coming to my mind. So mirror affirmations are extremely helpful, and then body scaling. You know, I think so easily we can kind of summarize our entire day into saying like. No, oh, it was terrible. Every day I feel awful about my body every day. Well, let's take a step back. Let's see. On a scale of one to 10, how do you feel about your body today? You know, maybe today you might feel like a four, tomorrow you might feel like a five, the next day you might feel like a three. It helps you adjust and understand, um, like it helps us just be more aware, you know? You can even say like 3.75, tomorrow it's a 3.76. Hey, it's 1% better. And that's, that's what matters, right? Like that diet culture just wants us to focus on everything that's like negative and wrong. Um, and this is really helpful. I mean, I love scaling for so many things, not only for body image, we can also do it with hunger and fullness on a scale of one to 10, how hungry, how full are we? Um, I think honestly, they do a lot of scaling too, even like in hospitals, right? Like with pain and stuff. So I really like it. See, you know, assess yourself and see what it's like and what it feels, you know, what is going on. So, so yeah, so I am, I, I really love that I am proud of because um, I actually wrote those on like heart, I like cut out heart uh, construction paper and would write like I am proud of and, and what it would be um, and kind of created a little booklet. And then as you build them, you know, you can have like 10, 15, 20, whatever it might be, and read through them every night. You know, I am proud of X, Y, Z because, and again, it starts to help build um, onto that confidence um, for ourselves. So let's look. All right. So the last step, guys, is going to be building community. This is so important, you know, in a world where I feel like sometimes, you know, it's like off so often against us, you know, having the support, having friends, having a community is so, so, so helpful in, in recovery and building that confidence. You know, uh, it's, it is like, so often I hear it with my clients that, you know, in the session, it's like, all right, I can do this, but then outside of it, who am I going to lean on? You know, I can talk to you about this, but outside, what do I do? 
So as stressful as social media might be, it also can be a really helpful tool and a great way to, um, a, great, a great resource. There's a lot of positive, body positive Instagram people. Um, if you follow me, which I'll have my slide later on, uh, I'm often sharing a lot of the people that I really enjoy uh, and have those, spread those messages. There's also Facebook groups um, that allow us to have that community and safe place to engage in intuitive eating or a body positive community. Create your own book club. Try, one to, try reading one of the following um, with some friends and have some really great discussions. Honestly, these three books are what I, um, the three books that I will reference throughout the, the presentation. Embody by Connie, I'm gonna say her last name wrong, so I'm just gonna say Connie, and Elizabeth Scott. Um, I went and I did their body positive um, training out in California. It was the best workshop of my life. I felt okay about my body. I was like, all right, like, I don't know, who knows what I'm gonna learn, but I'm gonna go. And it was life changing. It was life changing in the sense that I didn't realize how much pressure or thoughts I had about my body, how many, what my roots were um, that, you know, made me, it helped me be more aware of, of, of my body and how I can share that with, with others. So a lot of these four principles are from the Embody book. The Anti-Diet book by Christy Harrison is amazing. And then of course, Intuitive Eating by Evelyn and Elise Rich are, uh, it's just phenomenal. They just came out with a fourth edition book actually. And as if I couldn't love them more, their fourth edition book is just fabulous. Um, and it is absolutely amazing. I do want to, I'm sorry, I should have, done this in a couple of slides back, but I do want to also recognize that intuitive eating is absolutely a privilege that, uh, you know, having the financial ability to choose those foods that I want in the moment or having that is, is a privilege and to recognize that and, and definitely acknowledge that. And then also body image support groups. So find a body image support group. Um, they're often honestly running throughout um, the year. They're typically six to eight weeks. Uh, if you'd like to know more information, you can absolutely email me and I can see what is available right now. Um, but I know that there is like a couple of them and it's really helpful to, again, build that community, build that, that circle um, to help lift us up when it feels like, you know, everybody is, you know, coming against us. And so the one book I did not mention, and it's here on this slide, is The Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. Guys, I cannot recommend this enough. Oh my gosh, it was, I honestly recently just bought it and I, I really could not put it down. It was just phenomenal. She gave excellent prompts. Some of the journal prompts actually that I used earlier were from her books. She also talks about um, gives us some affirmations and radical self-love and it is just it's awesome it's a great book if you guys want to read it with a group of people I feel like it was short and easy and easy to read and, and, and engage in so those are some different books that you can check out um, some podcasts um, that are really awesome um, YouTube their poodle science is a great video talks about about look Sorry, Poodle Science talks about health at every size. Uh, I really, really love it. Basically, if I were to describe it in a little nutshell synopsis, yeah, synopsis. Uh, Poodle Science kind of talks about like, all right, let's say we went to the dog park. And at the dog park, there's all these different kinds of dogs. There's Chihuahuas and Great Danes and Mastiffs and Labs. Well, all of a sudden the poodle comes in and says, you know what, you guys all have to go on the diet that I'm on. You all have to eat the same foods that I, that I eat. But the chihuahua doesn't eat the same thing as a poodle and a poodle doesn't eat the same thing as a mastiff. And so we've come in and told everybody that we need to, and we meaning diet culture and um, sometimes healthcare providers, 
have told us that this is the way that you need to look. And we all know that restricting ourselves and trying to change our bodies when our bodies are not meant to be changed is not helpful. So a starving mastiff is never going to be a chihuahua. So why do we do this to ourselves? It's an excellent video. It's about two or three minutes. That's what it's about. I highly recommend it. And then I have some Instagram people that I really love to follow. Um, Body Image with Brie is, uh, she was the one who actually talked about the body scaling. I absolutely adore her. She's phenomenal. If you have children um, or nieces or nephews, again, Kids Eat in Color is a really great resource as well too. So you have some awesome people there to, to follow. And if you would like, here is my contact information and my Instagram. Um, please, please, you know, hop on, follow me, and I will share that. And then you guys can follow whoever you would like and what you, you know, what you feel like you connect to. But that is my email. Please reach out if you have any questions. I, again, I love what I do. I love sharing this. I think the world needs to know. And um, yeah, I'm here. I'm here for you if you need anything. So. Thank you guys so, so, so much for being here, for listening. Uh, I hope you have a phenomenal uh, day and I hope that these tips uh, were helpful and at least kind of get us started in moving in that right direction. I mean, I could talk about this honestly for hours and hours, but I'm hoping I'm starting to plant the seed and that's, that's the hope of today. So enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Thank you, Abby, for having me. I'm so grateful for this opportunity and for allowing me to share. So thank you so, so, so much. All right, guys, take care.